On Saturday, June 5, 1976, as the Teton Reservoir was filling up behind a brand new dam for the very first time, the dam gave way. That unleashed a wave of water on the downstream communities and farmland, causing about a billion dollars in damage. Eleven people lost their lives. In honor of them and the thousands of people affected, we dedicate the 40th anniversary memorial program. I'm Jay Hildebrand. And I'm Carol Honus. This is the Teton Dam. And it certainly looks a lot different than it did 40 years ago before it failed. On that fateful Saturday, a small hole got larger until 80 billion gallons of water came roaring through this canyon. It began the morning of June 5th, 1976, when a whirlpool appeared behind the dam. Then, around 11 a.m., a small hole appeared in the dam itself, with the water seeping through. Two workers at the dam tried to fill it with their bulldozers, but no success. The hole got bigger. They ran to safety, and a few minutes before noon, the water rushed through a gaping break. failed, word reached Upper Valley radio stations. Reporters immediately broadcast a warning for people downstream to leave their homes. Rexburg radio station owner Don Ellis began broadcasting live from the dam. All right, thank you very much for your sandwich. We do have a very, very serious problem here at the Teton Dam. The whole north side of the downstream face, the downstream side of the dam, the whole north side is caving in. Look, there goes the whole, whole, whole side. That goes the whole complete side of the north edge of the Teton Dam. And the water in fine little, holy, great, what can I say? People downstream better get out. People downstream better get out. This is KRXK. We do have an emergency. Everyone below the Teton Dam on the north and south fork of the Teton River, evacuate your homes immediately. Just go. And it's just roaring mud, water, roaring and pouring down the Teton. The complete uh, electrical plant, everything below it. They've lost the caterpillars, vehicles, and everything down below there. And I don't know whether there's been any loss of life yet or not, but I don't know. We'll have to talk to people later. We can't say that for sure. Fantastic sight. What a sight. Look at the water coming through now. The, there goes another great big huge amount of earth caving in from the Teton Dam. Water downstream from the Teton, roaring down the Teton. People along the Teton River get out. You may not have time to save anything at all. The people that live right along the Teton River, both the north and the south forks of the Teton, you better get out. You may not have time to save hardly anything because the water now is just boiling down the Teton River. And water coming downstream on the Teton, monumental volume. People downstream on the Teton, there's no way you're going to save anything. Get, if you live along the river, get, get, get out right now. Early that afternoon, KIFI had the first news crew at the dam. The thing kept going and going until he ended up with what you've got here right now. But Whereabouts did you see the uh, leak at? Was it the lower part of the dam or uh, up towards the middle or where, Al? It would have been a, probably about a, approximately 100 feet from the top and about 50 feet from the right abutment. I see. Then it gave away over on the uh, west side there? Yes, this is what we call the right abutment would be on that uh, west right. side. So what happened? Why did it break? Well, there are three existing theories. I talked to Dale Swenson with the Fremont Madison Irrigation District, and he said theory number one, bad dirt. This just wasn't good for building a dam. There's too many fine material, too many fine particles in the soil that they used, and uh, that, that allowed the water to come in through that uh, north or west abutment. Theory two, they didn't pump enough cement, liquid cement, between the rocks. And theory three, Maybe they filled it too fast and didn't allow time for the dam to settle. When the Teton Dam broke right here, it was a 30-foot wall of water that just roared right down this canyon. It took out all the farm ground below it. It wiped out the little city of Wilford. It just splintered the Wilford Church in half. Families in Wilford had 20 minutes to evacuate. When they returned, they found their homes in shambles, foundations without walls, piled high with debris. Five people who didn't leave soon enough lost their lives. After Wilford, the floodwaters hit Sugar City. A couple of boys fishing were caught up in the wave. One didn't make it, the other did. There was one fellow over there and he was hollering for help. So we managed to get a boat and a motor and three of the fellows went across and found he had a collapsed lung and a big wave had put him up in that tree and you can see it's about 10 feet up there and he had come downstream from the Gardner Dam which I understand is about three or four miles upstream 
There's another fellow that was with him that's gone. I think they said his name was a Benson boy. And uh, he lives right around here? And so that's what I understand, yes. But this fellow's folks used to live in this area, and I don't think they live here now, but uh, his name is Daryl Griggs. Okay, so here we are at the drama. And Lucky young man. He has a collapsed lung. Now they're going to try to get him across this flood water to where they get him over here on this side to safety. Daryl apparently has a collapsed lung. Little do we know at this point in time the loss of life here in eastern Idaho. There were fears there would be a massive loss of life. In the end, 11 people died in the floodwaters. Day of 19. Before the flood on that spring day of 1976, the valley below the east bench of Rexburg probably looked very similar to this. But after the flood, it was a very different story. This is where it all started off in this direction towards Newdale, Idaho. And as we slowly come down the Snake River Valley, we see nothing but widespread flooding and destruction. Right now, we're looking at Sugar City, Idaho. Sugar City now is, looks like it's completely inundated by water. Just the tops of the homes and businesses sticking up out of the water. Coming down the upper Snake River Valley now towards Rexburg, Idaho. With the span of waters is estimated to be in the neighborhood of three to four miles across as we look through there. Some of our people was in favor of rebuilding that dam, and some of them were not. They... Forty years hasn't dimmed the memories of those who were impacted by the flood. I went to the homestead where Mark Ricks and Harold Hill, now in their 90s, live. Some of their sons were visiting, too. Do you remember seeing the floodwaters coming in? Were you watching that from somewhere when it, when it hit Rexburg? Oh, yes. What, did you, what do you remember about that? I remember watching those flood waters come in and my goodness I thought it's gonna drown this place. Harold Hill owned a drugstore on Main Street where this restaurant now stands. He remembers the wall of water rolling through Main Street. We could look over and we saw houses floating and it was, it was just surprised to, to have it that deep and that powerful. Hills and Rick's sons were young men at the time. Well, it, it, was, it was hard to really kind of comprehend. It was just seemed so unreal. It's like, this certainly can't be happening, um, but it was. Our town was small. Mm -hmm. Most all of us knew everybody's house. I knew everybody in high school. Yeah. And you just look around and go, oh, there goes so-and-so's house, and there goes so -and -so. You know, and it was, it was heartbreaking to watch that. You could see the, the, that brown wall of water coming across uh, from the north, uh, past Sugar City, through the, through the feedlot there, through the sawmill there, bringing uh, livestock and, and some huge logs uh, coming. But, uh, but it took a while for it actually to, to, to hit Rexburg. And uh, of course, those logs uh, hit houses, took them right off their foundations. And, uh, and we just wondered if we would ever be able to recover uh, from this kind of devastation. The Hansen family in the Burton area remembers when the dam failed like it was yesterday. Doris Hansen was 18 years old when the water started rising. The water level came on the house six feet up. We're up three feet on blocks and it came up to about like oh my this. Gosh, you'd have drowned. Oh, yeah. It would have been over your head. Nobody could believe it was real. Doris heard the news with her grandpa. Grandpa was laying on the couch listening to the news like he does at noon every day. Doris ran out to the garden to tell her father, and he wouldn't believe her. I went out the third time, and he came in, and he said, all right, let me hear this. I suggest that all the people that are anywhere near the river at all get out of the way. And then after he heard it, he said, oh, maybe it has. 
<laughs> so he got you guys out. He sent Doris, his wife, and his parents to higher ground. Then he and his son stayed behind to do what they could to combat the 10-foot-high wall of water headed their way. Soon, his home and all the surrounding farm ground was six feet under. So he steps off the front porch thinking the stairs are still there and the stairs are going to go whoosh. <laughs> Held the camera up in the air and came clear up to here, he said. Oh my gosh. That was scary. <laughs> Doris's daughter Jennifer has lived with the stories of the Teton Dam break all her life. One thing stands out in her mind. The victims of the flood were doggedly determined to get their lives back. She remembers one story in particular from her uncle. The flood came through and his house, it hit the roof. It went to the peak, right to the attic. And instead of throwing everything away, they pulled the paneling off the walls and laid it out in the yard, dried it off, and put that paneling right back up in the house as soon as it was clean and dry. Throwaway society did not exist at the time. <laughs> in the end, nothing proved to be more precious than the lives that were saved. And pictures. Nothing was regretted more than the pictures they couldn't save. The black and white were the ones that we could save. Right. The colored ones didn't save very good. President Ford declared the Upper Snake River Valley a disaster. I urge the Congress to act promptly on my appropriation request to ensure that the victims of this tragic catastrophe can rebuild their lives and rebuild their communities. From Rexburg, the flood headed toward Manan, skirted around Rigby and filled Roberts with two to three feet of water, and then swept towards Idaho Falls. When the floodwaters hit Idaho Falls, the city was ready. The late Civil Defense Director, Captain T.J. Wadsworth, told me 30 years ago just how Idaho Falls saved itself. What were some of the steps you took then to protect the downtown area when you feared that flooding would come? Immediate steps were to call up our emergency operations staff. And the call up hardly had to be affected because the first one into the emergency ops center was the mayor of Idaho Falls, Van S. Eddie Pedersen, Don Lloyd from City Public Works, Bob Gray was already out sandbagging on the river. Immediately I called over using the media. You folks were great, all of you together. We called for volunteers and we raised a civil defense force of some 10,000 people we had levees here that resembled those on the American River down in California. And we passed, like I say, this tremendous wall of water through Idaho Falls with minimal property damage and no loss of life. It was people helping people, and believe you me, at that time, I named us the city that saved itself because we did that. Blackfoot was the last major town to be hit by the flood. Ironically, the flood damage to Blackfoot was much worse than to Idaho Falls. Here's how reporters described the situation at the time. The situation in Blackfoot today was described as critical. Late this afternoon, the water level was 10 feet above flood stage, the worst reading since 1894. Emergency vehicles were in almost constant motion, delivering messages, bringing in supplies, and helping to coordinate the disaster relief effort. The spirit of the people was in evidence as relief centers were opened in various churches and schools, and those not affected directly responded with a multitude of donated items. After Blackfoot, the floodwaters continued along the path of the Snake River to the American Falls Reservoir, where they would be caught and stopped. Three days after the dam collapsed, the destructive force of the flood was successfully held in check by the American Falls Dam. As the floodwaters subsided, the disaster was far from over. In fact, it was only then that the true magnitude of the disaster could be seen. With the danger behind them, the people began the tremendous task of cleaning up.
Blackfoot and Firth continued their cleanup operations today, and the Emergency Operations Center for Bingham County released its damage estimates. The hardest hit in terms of money were commercial businesses, but in terms of human suffering, it was the estimated 200 homes that were partially or totally destroyed. It's been several days now since cleanup has begun in Rexburg, but it's still a mess. A weary indication of how big the job really is. The high water mark on the buildings is almost five feet. Homeowners weren't the only ones hurt. An unmeasurable amount of topsoil was washed away, just devastating farmland. And an estimated 13,000 cattle were killed and had to be disposed of. Many of them hauled away by helicopter. Harold Hill remembers one drug company sent a van full of essential medicines. And, uh, and we rented a small trailer house and parked it on our sidewalk. And so we filled prescriptions from the trailer house on the sidewalk for several days. But it, uh, it, it took care of the need for medicine for people. The outpouring of aid and concern for the flood victims was one of the remarkable things that came out of the disaster. Organizations from the Red Cross to the Salvation Army to churches pitched in. LDS Church President Spencer W. Kimball made a personal visit to offer encouragement to the predominantly Mormon population. In addition, a special interfaith group was set up. It was LDS State President Mark Ricks who headed up the effort to see to the people's welfare right after the flood. He used a program already in place where every family in the church is assigned a pair of home teachers to look after their needs and report back to church leaders. When federal disaster officials came, they found relief efforts already in good hands. I told them when I went down to their meeting, I said, now we have the, the means of contacting people individually, and if you'll work through us, then we'll help you reach people and so they did. They all come through us and we work through the home teaching program. In an interview I had with Ricks years ago, he told me what happened then. After that federal disaster agent had been here for a few days, he came to me and he says, you don't need me anymore. He says, you folks are running this operation. He says, I'm just in your way. The Teton Interfaith Disaster Task Force has undertaken a fence building project in the Wilford area. Ricks praised the work of other local churches and local government relief efforts as well. There's one thing Ricks' sons remember about that summer. I remember he was gone all the time. He was gone uh, early in the morning before I got up and usually didn't come home till way late at night, oftentimes after I'd gone to bed. To have that happening right here, this little town of Ricksburg was really something. I've never forgotten it. The location of Ricks College here on higher ground turned out to be a lifesaver when it came to housing and feeding those whose homes were lost in the flood. Ricks Food Service staff worked around the clock for three days straight, serving a total of 750,000 meals. Many said it reminded them of the story in the Bible about the fishes and the loaves feeding the 5,000. Somehow they never ran out of food. For everyone affected by the 1976 Teton Dam break, their ability to overcome what seemed to be an overwhelming task is something for which they can always be proud. Inspiring. It was. You could, you couldn't uh, believe how many people had time off to come and help us, and but it, it took all of us to get everything back the way it should be. And now, 40 years later, as some of us reminisce on it, and still can't look at a at a. A catastrophe, a tornado, a flood, or anything on television without conjuring up some of those memories of, of what this community and what this part of the valley went through and the way people joined together, uh, joining not only hands, but, but joining hearts in, in making this uh, a closer-knit community. So one big question remains as we look towards the 40th anniversary of the Teton Dam breaking, and that is, should it ever be rebuilt? Well, yes, if it was up to me and our irrigation district, we would go ahead and build it. But obviously, the community at large has something to say about that. 
there's still a lot of memories out there about about the first about the failure. Uh, the environmental community are totally set against it. Uh, we would have to somehow convince them that we could have enough mitigation measures in place to uh, to put another dam there, and maybe they still wouldn't be in favor of it. I don't know. But uh, and then of course we'd have to. Uh, convince Congress that it's a good idea. Is that okay? Because that's, that's probably where the funding would come from. Swenson says he lives below the dam site and he has no worries about a new dam being safe. They would probably build it out of like something like roller compacted concrete. You roller compact dry cement and wet it as you go but you compact it and it's just like a formed uh, concrete dam. I believe the technology and know-how is there to build a safe dam. Over the past half hour, we've seen what happened here 40 years ago. We've seen the stories of destruction and despair. But we've also seen the stories of courage and goodwill and love. You know, someone said they wouldn't want to experience it. I'd, I'd do it again in a heartbeat just because of the the good things that happened, just the, the friendships and the, and the people I got to know. This is not something you would wish on anyone, but it's something that came with, with blessings and benefits that we probably couldn't have achieved any other way. There was a great spirit there of people coming together, working together to help each other. It was truly a blessing, an amazing thing. It's those memories that have lived on the past 40 years. And it's those memories that will probably live on for years to come in the hearts and minds of the people involved in this flood. Reporting from the Teton Dam, I'm Jay Hildebrand. And I'm Carol Honus. Thanks for joining us.